In this video, we'll discuss the expansion and security of U.S. borders and the Monroe Doctrine. Sharing Oregon and Acquiring Florida The robust nationalism of the years after the War of 1812 was likewise reflected in the shaping of foreign policy. To this end, the nationalistic president, Monroe, teamed with his nationalistic secretary of state, John Quincy Adams, the son of the ex-president. To its credit, the Monroe administration negotiated the much underrated Treaty of 1818 with Britain, which permitted Americans to share the coveted Newfoundland fisheries with their Canadian cousins. The agreement also fixed the vague northern limits of Louisiana along the 49th parallel from the Lake of Woods to the Rockies. The treaty further provided for a 10-year joint occupation of the untamed Oregon Territory without a surrender of the rights or claims of either America or Britain. To the south lay semi-tropical Spanish Florida, which many Americans believed geography and providence had destined to become part of the United States. America already claimed West Florida where uninvited American settlers had torn down the Spanish flag in 1810, and Congress ratified this grab in 1812, and during the War of 1812 against Spanish, Spain's ally Britain, a small army seized the Mobile region. When revolutions broke out in South America, notably in Argentina in 1816, Venezuela in 1817, and Chile in 1818, Spain was forced to denude Florida of troops to fight the rebels, and General Andrew Jackson saw an opportunity. On the pretext that hostile Seminole Indians and a fugitive slaves were using Florida as a refuge, Jackson secured a commission to enter Spanish territory, punish the Indians, and recapture the runaways, but he was to respect all posts that were under Spanish control. Early in 1818, Jackson swept across the Florida border, hanged two Indian chiefs without ceremony, and after hasty military trials, executed two British subjects for assisting the Indians and seized the two most important Spanish posts in the area, St. Mark's and then Pens Pensacola, where he deposed the British governor. Jackson exceeded his instructions from Washington and President Monroe, alarmed consulted his cabinet who were disavowing or disciplining the who wanted to disavow or discipline the overzealous Jackson all except John Quincy Adams who demanded huge concessions from Spain in the mislabeled Florida Purchase Treaty of 1819 Spain ceded Florida as well as Spanish claims to Oregon in exchange for America's abandonment of claims to Texas soon to become part of independent Mexico after the Napoleonic Nightmare, the rethroned autocrats of Europe banded together in a kind of monarchical protective association and undertook to stamp out undertook to stamp out the democratic tendencies that had sprouted from soil. They considered rich, manured by the ideals of the French Revolution. The world must be made safe for democracy. With complete ruthlessness, they smothered the embers of the rebellion in Italy in 1821 and Spain in 1823, and it was rumored that they were gazing across the Atlantic. Many Americans were alarmed that the European countries would send powerful fleets and armies to restore the colonies of Spanish America. They still cheered from when Latin American republics rose from the ruins of monarchy. The southward push of the Russian bear from the chill region now known as Alaska had already publicized the menace of monarchy to North America. In 1821, the Tsar of Russia issued a decree extending Russian jurisdiction down to the line of the 51st parallel. The fear prevailed that they were planning to cut the Republic off from California, its prospective window on the Pacific, as the Russians had now reached as far south as San Francisco. Great Britain, still mistress of the seas, was now beginning to play a lone hand role on the complicated international stage. 
it recoiled from joining hands with the continental European powers in crushing newly won liberties of the Spanish Americans. These revolutionists had thrown open their monopoly-bound ports to outside trade and British shippers as well, as well as Americans, and all had profited. Accordingly, in 1823, George Canning, a British Foreign Secretary, approached the American minister in London with a startling proposition. Would not the United States combine with Britain in a joint declaration renouncing any interest in acquiring Latin American territory and specifically warning the European despots? The tenacious nationalist Secretary Adams asked why should the lordly British, with the mightiest navy afloat, need America as an ally? An America that had neither naval nor military strength, such a union, argued Adams, was undignified. Adams, ever alert, thought that he detected the joker in the canning proposal. The British feared that the aggressive Yankees would one day seize Spanish territory in the Americas, which would jeopardize Britain's possessions in the Caribbean. If Canning could seduce the United States into joining him, America's own hand would be morally tied. A self-denying alliance with Britain would not only hamper American expansion, concluded Adams, but it was unnecessary. He suspected that the European powers had not hatched any definite plans for invading the Americas, and that in any event that the British Navy would prevent the approach of hostile fleets, because, would be because of South American markets. The Monroe Doctrine was born late in 1823, when the nationalistic Adams won the nationalistic Monroe over to his way of thinking, and the President, in his annual message to Congress on December 2, 1823, incorporated a stern warning to the European powers. Its two basic interventions were non-colonization and non-intervention. Monroe first directed his verbal volley primarily at the lumbering Russian bear in the Northwest. He proclaimed that the era of colonization in America had ended. He trumpeted a warning against foreign intervention. He was clearly concerned with regions to the South where fears were felt from the fledgling Spanish-American republics. Monroe directed the crowned heads of Europe to keep their hated monarchical systems out of this hemisphere and that the U.S. would not interfere in Greece. So basically, the Monroe Doctrine is a U.S. doctrine put forth by James Monroe saying that European powers were no longer to colonize or interfere with the affairs of newly, appended, newly independent nations in the Americas. So they were to stay out of the Western Hemisphere, and the United States agreed that it would not interfere in the Eastern Hemisphere. The monarchs of Europe were angered at Monroe's doctrine. Having resented the American experiment from the beginning, they were now deeply offended by Monroe's high-flown pronouncement, all the more so because of the gulf between America's loud pretensions and its soft military strength. Monroe's solemn warning made little splash in the newborn republics to the south. Anyone could see that they were only secondarily concerned about his neighbors, because he was primarily concerned about defending the United States against future invasion. Americas applauded it and then forgot it. Not under 1845 did President Polk revive it. Even before Monroe's stiff message, the Tsar had decided to retreat. This he formally did in the Russian-American Treaty of 1824, which fixed his southernmost limits at the line of the 5440 parallel the present southern tip of the Alaska, Alaska Panhandle. The Monroe Doctrine might have more accurately been called the Self-Defense Doctrine. President Monroe was concerned basically with the security of his own country, not of the country in Latin America. The doctrine was just as big as the nation's armed forces and no bigger. The Monroe Doctrine has had a long career of ups and downs. It was never law domestic or international, but it was a pledge, and it was not a pledge or an agreement, but real, merely a simple, personalized statement of the policy of President Monroe. But the Monroe Doctrine in 1823 was largely an expression of the post-1812 nationalism 
energizing the United States. The doctrine proved to be the most famous of all the long-lived offspring that the nationalism, and basically it deepened the illusion of that nationalism in the United States. And we'll discuss the Monroe Doctrine and its impact on the United States and in Latin America and Europe in more detail in class.